So I'm here today on a sunny Pacific Northwest day. I say that tongue in cheek because it rains up here a little bit, but it doesn't stop us from having fun with our Porsches. I'm uh, at an event with uh, my buddy here, Billy Schott. Billy, good to Hi. see you today. Nice to see you too. You bet. And we're going to be talking a little bit about Porsche 914s and their 50th anniversary. Can you believe it? It's been 50 years since this car has been around. Uh, Billy invited me to be here. I'm the host and producer of the Cars Yeah podcast and television show, so check me out on CarsYeah.com. But we're going to talk about this event that Billy put together. Welcome to the 914 turnout. Thank you. I'm glad to have you here and all the other people that joined us. Yeah, we're going to talk to a bunch of people today, a bunch of people that showed up in the rain, some that brought their cool cars that are back here behind us. Uh, but let's start with you, Billy. I've been asking, I will be asking, I should say, all the guests a couple of basic questions, things that I ask people on the Cars Yeah podcast. First and foremost, when did you know that you were going to be a car guy? Let's go back in time. Well, uh, I had an older brother who was like three years older than me, and he liked to build model cars. And of course, I had to copy my brother. <laughs> so I fell in love with model cars. Yeah, I did too. I built a lot of model cars in the day. Did you have an affinity for Porsche back then, or was it just any car? It was really any car. Uh, we'd play with boats and planes a little bit, but we had to buy cars. And uh, one day, he drove home with a 914. Wow. And I was in love with that car. And he'd take me out for rides, and I, I was just starting to get my license and getting a little bit of driving experience, and he went and got engaged and his father-in-law gave him a Camaro. So suddenly he had two cars, yep. and he said, you know, you can have that 914, just take over the payments. <laughs> nice. And so I was a young man driving a new 914. Lucky you. That was exciting. Yeah, what color was it? It was blue, and I don't remember which version of blue, but it was, it was beautiful blue to me. And you still have that car? I, unfortunately, I had to sell it. Uh, the, those payments of $80 a month, were just too much. too much for me to manage. <laughs> Fantastic. Have you had other Porsches in your lives other than this beautiful car you have behind us? Uh, I've had this car since I was like 21 years old. Oh, wow. Uh, it was my daily driver for a lot of years. When my kids were little, I used to shove them in the center console and, and take <laughs> them out for rides in it. Uh, but uh, this car has stuck with me. It did spend a few years on jack stands in the garage. So tell me a little bit about the car, how it sits today? Uh, I was fortunate that I had a chance uh, to go back to college and learn how to do auto body when I was in my 50s. And so... Back to college in your 50s? Yes, it was fun. You and Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, you know, the, the kids would kind of drag themselves to school, but the old man, he was there when the teacher opened the door. Oh, yeah. So I took the door in to start with, and it was all rusted out on the bottom. And I learned how to weld, and I learned how to patch it up. Wow. And the uh, the channels where the, the rain is, uh, the, the rubber for the rain goes through, I, I was able to remake those. Wow. And it was just so much fun. And one thing led to another. Uh, the car sat on a rotisserie for a dozen years or so while I redid each and every part. Yeah, I think this is cool. Uh, kind of uh, rekindling your passion for cars and lear learning and knowledge. You keep, you're never too old to learn new tricks, right? Right, and it was it was like building a model car all over again. It was just a little bit bigger and a little bit more expensive. See, we went back to the front of our talk here a little bit. So as the car sits today, it's drivable. You drive it. We have a very, as we see, a very rainy day today. Uh, I like the fact that you get out. That was on cue. You get out and enjoy driving the cars. Uh, putting together this whole event for the 914 turnout, was that because of your passion for the 914? Uh, it was really for my passion for the people. You know, the 914 community, I think like all the other car club communities, is made up of people with a little common thread, and it just brings them together. And then you make friends, right. and you go do things together, and it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful part of life. Yeah. The thing I've learned about car clubs and about the car culture is the cars are just the catalyst that bring us all together. I mean, here's a pretty crummy weather day, but we're still here to have some fun. Talk about our passion for Porsches, 914s in particular. 
but it's more about the car the car people you get to meet i get to talk to a whole bunch of people today just like i do on my podcast so uh, i think it's fantastic i want to thank you for having me here um dragging me out of bed i might have still been sitting home watching the seahawks i think i'd rather be here with some car people enjoying it billy this is great and i think it's great that you take your personal time you and your lovely wife to do this this is no easy thing this takes a lot of work you and i started talking about this months ago i appreciate what you do thank you for having me thank you so much for being here you bet and thank you for you viewers as well i encourage you to check me out on cars yeah the podcast and the tv show now we're going to go have some fun all right rich welcome to uh another beautiful day in the pacific northwest yeah. we're enjoying some some sunshine liquid sunshine as we call it i want to start with you go back in time a little bit and talk about your first realization that you were going to be a car guy really um tougher because i started out as a motorcycle guy and uh how i got into the 914s is truly a lark um while doing a uh a delivery for a friend of mine some who's moving from seattle to laguna beach california i uh, was wandering around in the late 80s early 90s uh, in uh, in laguna beach which is really a very ritzy you know glitzy kind of a place at the time everybody's crazy colors and high fluting cars and walked onto a jag lot saw this kind of quirky little car that was sitting in the back row with some dust on it and um, I was flush with some cash from my job and asked the guy you know the lot guy you know what's that there and he goes oh trade in you know how much you want oh well only check with my manager and uh, came back and it was a very modest amount turns out it was my very first 914 and uh, from there I kind of took off turned into a, a sort of a high side hustle after many years and uh, then turned into a small business. You know, I love your story because yesterday we were at a 914 event. We were at Larson Porsche talking about 914s and I heard your story and it was really intriguing. In fact, I want to invite you to be a guest on my Cars Yeah podcast because you're doing what my podcast is all about. People who wrap their passion for automobiles into their careers and lives. So you took, turned a side hustle of working on 914s into a career now. Tell me a little bit about your business. So um, it's called 914 Work, and really it is uh, focused on the 914 and Type 4 engines in particular. Uh, I know, you know, the history of the 914 was sort of a rocky one <laughs> from its inception, uh, the creation of the car, to its history and its acceptance into the Porsche community has been somewhat sketchy. Mm -hmm. um, but folks are finally coming around. They're starting to realize the true, unique uh, you know, features and nature of the car and really love it and are now willing to fix them up and spend them instead of sort of burn them into the ground as they have been over these many, many years. So I've taken that opportunity and the other side of that is simply that all it's been quite a long time since these cars have been built and you know 50 years here we are and uh, all the people that knew how to fix them how to take care of them and so forth have sort of aged out so i'm feeling a niche and i'm hopeful it will take off and continue to uh, enrich me and all those people that i help out with their, their cars tell me a little bit about your 914 the car you have right now so that car that I was describing in the, earlier in the story it simply um, was caught my eye because it was a little weird colored, uh, a very bright uh, or light ivory kind of white color with some orangish kind of striping and wheels and, and so forth. I didn't know anything about it. I was, like I say, a really a lark when I, when I saw it and purchased it. Um, but when I drove it uh, home, I actually got up the next day to drive myself home, I drove 18 hours straight through LA traffic and, and so forth with a hella sunburn and a huge grin on my face, only stopping for gas and bathroom breaks and so forth. Um, I did the following day pull into a local VW uh, Porsche dealership that happened to be in Seattle at the time, and because there was something broken or something, you know, that I wanted to replace, and pulled into the lot and it attracted a, you know, a uh, collection of people and they're going hey look at this Ooh, ah. I'm going okay 
yeah, you got something special here. This is a you know very limited car. And I go, oh, nice, okay, great. And uh, so yeah, it was my introduction to. Apparently, in 1974, Porsche released a limited edition batch of cars, uh, supposedly a thousand cars, in two variation, variations: a light ivory with a phoenix red trim, which is more like orange and a black car with yellow or sunflower yellow trim, um, nicknamed both the uh, Creamsicle and the Bumblebee for their color schemes, uh, that were uh, to commemorate the um, Can-Am series, a uh, racing series that was that the Porsche was dominating at the time with the 917 race car. And uh, so after, uh, you know, however many years that was at that time, there were very few of these cars around. and. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of uh, Jeff Boldy that uh, maintains a registry, an online registry, um, so you could look that up. He, uh, he's trying to keep track of all of these cars, and supposedly out of a thousand, there's still about mm, something less than 300 of them known to exist. So it's a little, little rare and a little unique, and um, I really, really enjoy it, and I've really enjoyed studying it and understanding all the little features and, and details that are about it. Yeah, it's a fantastic car. I got to explore it yesterday at uh, the Larson dealership. I think it's fantastic. More so, I think it's fantastic that you've wrapped this passion you have in your career now. How long have you been doing your business? I only started it uh, a year and a half ago. Wow, and it's going well? So far, I'm, you know, uh, it's uh, it's helping seal both the friendships I've you know made along the along lines with all of these friends that that I've helped and, and uh, recognized through 914 ownership um, and, you know, making new ones. Every one of these folks I, I run into, they have a, a similar passion for the car because they want to keep it going. And uh, I really appreciate that and appreciate them for doing so. Since you stumbled onto your creamsicle car, uh, since you started doing your business, give me one or two things that you've learned about 914s that have really surprised you. Surprise me. Um, hmm. Well, one, they are a lot more reliable than people give them credit for. I, I, I once I restored my particular car, um, I use it pretty much regularly. I, I'm still a motorcycle guy, so whenever I have the opportunity, I'm racing or riding motorcycles. But uh, the other side is they're great around town cars and so forth. The flip side of that is. Nowadays, and now we're you know 50 years later, cars are so big, and that car is so small. It is uh, you have to be very uh, adept at driving it and very cautious because people aren't looking for you. It's more like riding a motorcycle, which I'm familiar with, so it doesn't really bother me too much. But I can see how it'd be a little sketchy for some people. You know, I was thinking the same thing because I had a 2.0 73 914 I bought for my son. When he was 15, my wife looked at me and said, no, I don't think so. But I'll tell you, driving that car on the freeway with the big SUVs and trucks these days, yeah. people look right over the top of you and pull right in front of you. I used to ride motorcycles, so I'm familiar with that consciousness of everyone's out to kill me right. mode. So that's what you do in a 914. I've asked all my guests today one last question. If I could buy you any cool 914 that exists on the planet, even if it's at the Porsche Museum, doesn't matter where it is, I'm going to park it in your garage. And it might be the car you already have. You might want to keep that and save me a few bucks, but I'll buy you whatever you like today. What would it be? Hmm. Uh, interesting question. I'm not sure. It'd probably be a project car. I like working on the cars. I like, I like uh, you know, restoring the cars. I like uh, figuring out what was necessary. I'm more of a purist than uh, a, mod, a mod guy, but, uh, but I have a car which I mod to. I have a sort of a mule car that... I also produce, uh, manufacture little odds and ends for the cars and so forth. So try them out on that and so forth. But uh, probably a project car. Just something, you know, and maybe a six. I'm not sure. You win the most unique answer of the day. But, you know, I like that. It shows you're a purist and enthusiast. And what you're doing for a living now is definitely what you love. 
So, Rich, thank you. Thank you. This has been great. You too. So, Todd Brown, uh, we're here there today with you on this beautiful, uh, sunny <laughs> Pacific Northwest day. A little bit of rain falling down, but nothing ever stopped us Porsche people from going out. I want to talk to you a little bit about Porsche 914s because they're celebrating the 50th anniversary here today. So, let's go back in time first and talk about when you knew that you were going to be a car guy. Oh, boy. I kind of got a late start on it. Um, didn't really get super interested in automobiles until uh, college when I had a part-time job at a, a service center. So then it really hooked and grabbed me. I started hanging out with more people with cars and you know really getting deeper and deeper into fixing things. I've always liked fixing things, but getting into cars and fixing cars didn't happen until I was 18 or 19 years old. So you've always been uh, a mechanic in a sense. You like to fix things. And I know for your regular day job, you're a mechanic? Yes, I'm a lead mechanic at King County. I work on the buses. Oh, cool, great. Well, how about Porsche though? Is there a point in time when Porsche became a market choice for you? I've always liked uh, the Porsches, the German cars in general. I worked at BMW for many years. Um, drove a dad car for 20 years and when the kids all had their own driver's licenses and I didn't need to haul them around, I started looking for a midlife crisis car. And I only had two stipulations. It was two-wheel drive, or rear-wheel drive, and uh, two-door. So I started looking around. It could have been British, it could have been German, it could have been Japanese, I didn't care. And I found an ad for a 914. And so it was cheap, and we hauled up to Bellingham, picked it up, then I found out the hard way how bad these things can be. A very rusty car, it's really not in good shape. So I got it running, never drove it because I was afraid to. It's about to crack in half. Found another car a little closer to home, drove that, looked at it, this is the yellow car I have here now. And that was about five years ago. Wow, pretty cool. So you learned the hard way how yeah. to really buy <laughs> A Porsche. I understand that. We've all done that kind of thing. So tell me a little bit about your yellow car here. Um, it sat in the garage for 25 years because Grandpa didn't want to spend $100 to have it fixed. So the grandmother gave it to her grandson, and he was a music teacher. Not very mechanically inclined. His neighbor had a Vanagon and some spare parts. So they, put, they took the fuel injection off. They put the carburetors off the Vanagon on it and a couple other things that would work on that Type 4 engine and got it running. He was a little tired of it. He was a Subaru guy, but he didn't like the, the aspect he had to work on it once in a while. So he uh, puts it up for sale. And then I picked it up. It's not perfect, but everything I do to it makes it a little nicer. Yeah, there's always something to do with an old car. Oh, yeah. So what's the color, the yellow? That's sunflower yellow. And it would not have been my first choice. I'm more of a, a lime green Kawasaki guy, but um, it's grown on me. I don't think I would do a color change on it ever. I'd take it back to sunflower yellow. Um, there are pretty colors. I mean, 914s are like Skittles. You've got everything. And uh, there are some beautiful cars out there. Absolutely. I'm, I'm stuck on the, the sunflower yellow for this one. Well, a day like today with very gray and very wet, that car can be seen, so it's yeah. a lot safer <laughs> to drive. Uh, well, let me fast forward a little bit and offer you something today on this uh, this bleak day, something a little bright. I'm going to buy you any cool 914 <laughs> that exists what? out there. It doesn't matter which one it is or who owns it. I have the power to park it in your garage. Mm. What would it be? Oh, boy. I think I'd like to have one of the original GT cars. Yes. If money's no object, you got to dream big. <laughs> Absolutely. What is it about the GT car that you love so much? I like the purity of a race car. You know, there's, well, you don't have any luxuries. There's nothing there except what has to be there. And it's pretty similar to the cars even in their stock condition. They put what they had to put in there. You can't outsmart a German engineer. It's very difficult. <laughs> so what's there is there for a reason. And there's not a lot of extraneous stuff. Um, the days before, cup holders, all the little things. This is my daily driver. So I, I realize things like this, <laughs> you know, that it just don't exist back in, you know, 70. Yeah, well, I commend you for driving that car every day. I think it's fantastic. Uh, one last question. With that GT I'm going to buy you, <laughs> would it be yellow like your little bumblebee here? No, it would be sig signal orange, I believe. Oh, <laughs> my favorite. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Well, I'll get to work on that for you. Okay? Yeah, you do that. In the meantime, we'll go have a little fun in the rain here. Thanks for coming out today. Sure. And happy birthday to the Porsche 914. Todd, been great Perfect. to meet you. Great. You too, Mark. Thanks.
So Sherwin, thanks for coming out on this beautiful, sunny Pacific Northwest day as the waterfall goes behind you. Uh, it's a little wet up here, but that doesn't stop us from uh, having some fun with cars here, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Porsche 914. I want to start with going back in time a little bit about your history, perhaps your childhood, that point in your life when you knew you were going to be a car guy. It actually started with my father. My father um, was a car guy. He, he was one of the uh, first guys that I knew in the 40s to have a Harley. He, him and his brothers would drive around in Seattle Chinatown on Harleys and then from there it went to, I had one uncle with a hot rodder and my dad sort of fell in that same thing and and so I've always been around cars and dad was a big fan of Chevrolet so needless to say Chevrolet was the first word spoken in the car family. <laughs> Very cool. How about for you? What was the first car that was really special for you? first car was um, obviously being a Chevrolet family, um, anything related to Chevrolet, so the Corvette. Corvettes were sports cars, they were in this, in this 60s just coming up and just all that horsepower and they knew how to turn left and right instead of just straight. What do you think about the new Corvette that just came out, the mid-engine? It is very unique in the fact that um, it's, a, it's, it's, been want, it's been requested through fans for many, many years, especially if you're a car guy. That race, a mid-engine car, was the way to, the, the, where the engine should be, and that's how I got involved with um, uh, 914s and Porsches uh, in general. Because uh, race cars had mid-engines, they had, they were you know 914s with a five-speed, and it, it, I could make believe I was uh, racing the car on the streets like like today. You've done this before. Nice segue into the mid-engine car from the cor new Corvette to the 914. Very different cars, but let's talk about the 914 for a moment. Well, what was your first 914? First 914 was a 73. It was, um, it, it was, I bought it, I bought it in 75, and it was not in good shape, so the, so the person who sold me just made me a great deal on it. Unfortunately, that was the same time as the recall, the fuel line recall. Didn't know about that until the car burst in the flames on a piece of on the freeway and burned for an hour and a half. Oh my gosh. And so uh, unfortunately um, I learned a lot about how uh, exotic metals catch on fire, magnesium transmission cases and, uh, and such and it burned and uh, fortunately the settlement allowed me to get a better condition 74 914 2 liter and ironically the recall wasn't done on that one, and it also the line broke, but it did not catch on fire. Fortunately, I was able to call my father at one in the morning and say, "Bring my toolbox," and I rebuilt the fuel line at where I, the car broke down, and I got it home. Oh my gosh, that's crazy! Well, let's fast forward today. What do you do for a living? I'm retired now, but I was in the event planning business and the airline industry over the years, and yes, things. <laughs> now you get to play with cars, so. The car you have today, the different 914? I still have that original one that I bought. Unfortunately, it sits in a place where many unfortunate 914s sit, is in your garage on jack stands, wondering what to do as life got in your way. So in the meantime, I got into 911s, and I got into, uh, I've, I've always enjoyed mid-engine, so I got a Cayman, and I enjoyed that thoroughly, and then somehow I managed to get a hold of a GT4, and the GT4 is if, the dream of everybody's 914.6 is to have a 3-liter with a lot of horsepower and a lot of great power-to-rate ratio, and the GT4 does that. Wow. Yeah, that's that's the ultimate Cayman yeah. right there. Yeah. I, I enjoy it. I thoroughly enjoy it. Absolutely. Great cars. I love those cars. Well, let's uh, offer you a little special thing today. I'm going to buy you any cool 914 today. I've been asking all my guests today the same question. Any car that exists, it might be a specific car or just a model that you'd like me to buy you, but I'm going to buy it for you and park it in your garage next to that GT4. What could it be? <laughs> you know, I still like 914s and probably it'd be a, probably a 914 uh, with uh, no flares and a 3.2 3 liter motor Ooh. and a nice powder weight and just to have something uh, to hear that. Now, one thing I miss that the Cayman does not give me is the air-cooled fan of, an, of the six-cylinder engine. Yeah, so it's going to be a 914.6, but a punched-out motor, something a little faster, because that GT4 has uh, swayed you for speed, right? Yes, it does. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay, well, I'll get to work, and what color would you like that to be? 
Oh, well, you know, my yellow, my uh, 914 was yellow, and I still go to that, even though uh, everybody says, oh, you know what? No, yes, I do. Yellow, so yellow sun, sunflower yellow. There you go. Well, there's a nice sunflower yellow 914 sitting behind you, but I'll get to work on that six for you, all right? Thank you. Thank you for spending some time with me today. Thank you very much. This has been fun. So, Doug, you and I have known each other for a while. We're Porsche guys. Welcome to another sunny Pacific Northwest day here. A little wet out today, but... <laughs> We're going to have a little bit of fun talking about Porsche 914s and Porsches, but I want to first go back in time to your childhood. You have a very interesting childhood, but I want to focus on the cars in your childhood. And at that point in time when you knew that you were indeed going to be a car guy. So, Mark, um, I fell in love with Porsches at a very young age, like most of us um, who enjoy the cars. And as a very young man, I grew up in Tacoma, Washington, and I would walk along the avenue where all the car dealers were at. One of them was Tom Carson's Porsche Audi. And I would stop in front of the window at Tom Carson's Porsche Audi. It's a very young man, maybe eight or nine or ten, and stood, stand in the window and look at those cars for hours and hours. I'd look at the cars and people would buy them and drive them out. And when the 914 and the 356s were there, I looked at them and I said, I want to own one of those one day. I listened to the sounds, and that's where my love of Porsches began, was in, uh, was in, t in front of Tom Carson's. Tom Carson's, that's very cool. Well, let's fast forward to... The first time you got your first Porsche, I know you have a few Porsches, but they're all mostly older cars, fun cars, unique cars. Well, let's talk about the first time you actually got to own one. So I um, was working my way through college, and I was commercial fishing in Alaska. And it was a very good season that year. We came back with a lot of money. And I got off the boat in uh, Seattle, uh, went down to Tacoma right away, walked into Tom Carson's, and I said, I want a, I want a Porsche. <laughs> it was the 914 that was sitting on the floor. And at the time, by the way, they had the Bumblebee was on the floor. It was about $300 more, maybe $400 more than what my 914 was that I ended up buying. I didn't have the extra money. I was stretching it as it was. And so I walked in. I paid cash for my very first Porsche. That's cool. But that Bumblebee, those Can-Am versions, oh. the, yeah, uh, well, that's okay. We won't even go back there. But do you still have a 914 today? I still have a, nine, I have a 914 6 today. Uh, I've had a 914 1.8. I've had a 914 2.0. My 914.6 is in the process of restoration and has been for a number of times, but uh, I love my 914.6. Yeah, they're fantastic. The, the, the pinnacle of the 914 world, absolutely. Let me talk a little bit about why you like the 914, and I know you've got some other Porsches, but what is it about the 914 and the 6 that, make that makes that car unique? Uh, what got me interested in the 6 was a friend of mine had a 914 at the time. We were going down the road, I think it was like about 1.8 914. And we're going to a Porsche event, and this 914-6 passes us. And we're racing a little bit in times when you could do those things. And I said to my friend, I go, what is that car? He goes, that's the 914-6. And I said, I never even heard the 914-6. And that kind of became my passion to find the 914-6. And so subsequent years when I was able to purchase the 914-6, I loved the balance of the car. I loved the power to speed ratio. I loved the car that was unique and different from every other 914 that was on the road. And it was an absolute fun car to drive. What color is your car? Blue. Blue, yeah. Well, I had a blue one. Mine wasn't a 6. Yeah. If it was, I might still have it today. But it was a 2.0. It's a great car. Fantastic. Well, let's fast forward a little bit. You kind of got the pinnacle of the Porsche 914, the 6. And I've been asking some of my other guests today, if I could buy them one very cool 914, what would it be? So I'm going to ask you the same thing. It might be that you have the car you already love, but maybe there's a different one that you have your eyes on. I'll tell you, if I could buy one, if I bought one today, I would probably buy the Creamsicle. I absolutely have always loved the Porsche Creamsicle. Not sure why it attracted me. I saw one again in Tom Carson's at the time. Uh, I wanted to buy one a couple of years later. Never was able to find one, wasn't able to afford one as you start your family and life begins. So the 914 Creamsicle kind of went, went up by its side. But I've always loved the Creamsicle, as I have the Bumblebee, by the way. If I had my choice, I'd buy both of them. Yeah, absolutely. We all would have a stable yes. full of a whole lot of cars. Well, Doug, it's been good catching up with you again. I appreciate you coming out in the rain because uh, it's definitely a wet <laughs> one here today. But that's what it does. Uh, we'll talk again, but thanks for bringing your car here today. Thank you, Mark. You bet. All right, Matt, welcome to uh, celebrating the 914 50th anniversary anniversary in sunny Pacific Northwest. Liquid sunny, yes. Liquid sunny, yeah. yeah. Let's go back in time and start at the beginning here. Is there a point in your life when you knew that you were going to be a car guy? <laughs> uh, 
my brother's uh, the one that was the car guy. He kind of got me into this stuff. Uh, we were always, as we were growing up, he was always tinkering on a 914 or a 912, and I had a had a bug, but uh, I never really worked on them. I, I believed in just paying somebody else so I could spend my time driving them and having fun, and he was always tinkering on them and breaking them, so I thought I had the right idea. Well, sometimes that is the right idea. Let's fast forward to when your fascination for Porsche, and specifically the 914, began. So, um, about 2014, uh, my brother came to me and said, hey, I've, I've got this little hobby business, and it's getting a little bit more than what I can handle. I need some help. Can you, you know, can you step up and help me and, and let's see what we can do with this thing and maybe take it to the, the next level, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And so he'd been making parts uh, for the Porsche 914s and um, supporting the community on 914 World, which is um, kind of the support group for everybody that owns a 914. And it's very much a community service project. It's not making money or anything. It's just trying to help get the parts that we need for the cars. They were never supported by Volkswagen or Porsche. Um, so there was not a lot of things out there, and the cars were really never worth that much. You get a really nice car for $2,000, so uh, enough other used parts out there, people would pull one off of a parts car and get it to the next guy. Parts that were available were scarce and just not very good because there wasn't enough market for it. And uh, he had, when his kid became 15, they went and looked for a, a, a car so that they could do a father-son project. And it was the same thing that he, when he was a teenager, couldn't find parts and there wasn't anything. This kid gets on the, the internet and finds 914 World and signs up for an account and is asking questions like, well, where do you get this or how do I do that? And people are starting to help him and, and so my brother starts getting on there and getting some advice and some help. And at the time he was doing architectural um, engineering for railings and things like that and they were extruding glass and rubber and stuff like that. So the part they were looking for was some seal. He goes, this isn't that hard, I could make that. I was like, oh, well, if you can make it, I'd buy it. I'm like, well, okay, if enough people want to buy it, I'll make it. So he makes this first part and everybody just goes nuts. Oh, this is better than the original. This is, can you make this? So it's kind of all downhill from that. <laughs> and uh, so it, it quickly became something that um, it was a lot of fun and, and making the next part and making the next part and making the next part. And be, before he knows it, he's doing it in his garage, his neighbor's garage, some other guy's garage, and it's all community support, so everybody has their own skill sets, and we'd have people step up and go, well, I can help you do this part, oh, I can do this part, and, you know, Susie's mom can make the curtains, and we'll have a play in the backyard kind of thing, and uh, now, fast forward to about 2014, he's got all these parts that are doing, being done by machine shops, and, and trying to bring stuff together and all of these conversations from 914 World, he created a website. Well, the website was just kind of the end of the conversation. If you were on World and you knew what they were talking about, the website was okay, kind of automated the process of here's collect the money, here's where I send the part. But it was, you know, a part taken a, uh, on, a picture taken on his countertop and things weren't spelled right and it was, you know, kind of okay. But it, it functioned for that purpose. And I looked, that was the first thing I looked, I go, what are you doing? You can't even spell. What is this stuff? <laughs> I quickly kind of realized the evil genius behind it is like if you looked like Amazon, people would expect Amazon. You couldn't deliver on it, and now you're, you know, it's not good. So we go in and try and clean that up, and the guy from Germany that's trying to look something up, there's no part number. It's not spelled right, so Google's not going to translate it. So there was all these challenges of trying to organize just the, the website itself to make it work and and this part was really four parts in the parts catalog because it was a right and a left and this and that and so breaking them all down the individual stuff and then kind of rebuilding it back in there and so that's taken a lot of a lot of patience a lot of time a lot of learning so i didn't know where these parts fit what they go on or anything like that so i wanted to, to learn about this stuff so i picked up a, a 914 on craigslist oh gotta gotta get my barn find well this was a real barn find the car had been dry stored for about 23 years in temperature controlled storage. And the, we went from the mom to that delivered Mary Kay in the car to the kid who she swapped with him for, for painting the house or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And then it ended up in his barn. And so after he got it, he went and drove it and the bearing seized on the, on the right wheel and came off and kind of peeled the fender and he patched it up. And, but then didn't drive it for a very long time. 
So by the time I got to it, it was in, I should have tuned it up and drove it. But at the time it was, my son was going to college for auto body and he starts sanding on things and all of a sudden I'm committed to going farther than I really wanted to. And the slippery slope continued from there. So we had, uh, I, I figured it was the best way for me to learn these things and figure out how they fit, where they go, where they don't. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have a good friend of ours, Kerry Cutter, who does his day job is working on the race cars at, at Rossport Racing. Well, he has a barn that's five minutes from my house. It's closer to me than to him. So as we start to assemble the car back together, he let me bogart his lift for about six months as I was reassembling. And every time I would get stuck on something, then I would say, okay, Kerry, come teach. And I would, we would get things put back together and, and learn a little bit more. So it became a real educational process for me. And the 914 World had this build-off challenge where had to be running and driving by 914. So <laughs> this car turns into this over, you know, overwhelming project where I got to get done by 914. Mm -hmm. But I painted it. I can't put this dirty part back on this shiny car. I got to restore this. And so I just go in deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So the end of it probably should have been a TV show. It just went, it was nuts. So it, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to take the car to Octiner Fest, which is this weekend as well and it was in uh, North Carolina. So that's you know a week's worth of driving to get it out there. The car's not quite ready, so I'm thinking I'm gonna have to pull over along the way and keep putting parts on as I'm working my way out there. This isn't gonna be fun. Then this time of year, you get hurricanes out there, and there was one that was bearing down on that. So I pull the car, I get the car in the trailer, I'm getting ready to go, my wife's like, you don't even know if there's gonna be roads there when you get there. Why are you doing this? I'm like, okay, I pull the car off, 36 hours of working non-stop. I decided I'm, I'm just going to go to, to the one in Colorado because that'll buy me a couple of days. And Carrie gets me set up with Rothsport to get all of the corner balancing and, and brakes and everything all dialed in perfectly. He's got an appointment for me on Monday. I have this parts pile that just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller so I can like see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so I just stay in the barn, putting parts on, putting parts on, putting parts on. 36 hours straight, I'm rummy. I had to get to the appointment, so I, I get the car in the trailer, I take it over to Rossport, and you know, at this point I got mush brain, and I'm trying to think, oh, I gotta get the wheel changed in the truck. Okay, I'm gonna, you guys work on that, I'll go down the street and get the wheel changed. I make it about a mile, and I wake up on the curb with the truck and the trailer. Oh gosh, this isn't good. So I go back and take a nap on their, on their employee couch, and when I come down, Jeff has pulled the entire crew, and they're doing a clinic on my car, and it was, I was just so overwhelming because here's, you know, $3 million car here, $3 million car there, cool race cars. They've dropped everything and they're, they're doing a clinic on this car. So I was really overwhelmed. And long story short, we get the car, take it up to Colorado. The car ends up winning the, the build off challenge for that year, which was pretty cool, but they're never done. So they got to tinker a little bit more. I had a, a carbureted car and I had it running perfect at this altitude, but at Colorado in the Rockies, not so much. So then it was, we should do micro squirt, and then you have fuel injection, and you can do any altitude. So then it went deeper down that rabbit hole, which took a while to get it figured out. But now the car is just an absolute blast to drive. It's a 1.7 that has um, a lot of reliability, and it's the joy of driving a slow car fast and trying the to keep up with people. The restoration rabbit hole, you went so deep, <laughs> there was no light at the end what a story yeah. that's absolutely incredible yeah. well let me fast forward to what i've been asking all the guests today and that mm -hmm. is if i could buy you any cool 914 on the planet which one would it be would it be the car you have would you keep it or could i buy you something different well one of the things that happens with these cars is they're like rabbits they tend to multiply <laughs> so you can't have just one apparently so i did get my dream car i i, I was able to pick up a 914.6 that uh, when you buy a 914.6 it's not buying a car it's more of an adoption process so I was deemed worthy to be the caretaker of the car and I have that one which had as I was going through all the paperwork has a track record on Laguna Seca and it's just runs like a scalded cap and it's a lot of fun to drive so I think I'm good and if I bring another car home I, I would be in a lot of trouble I think, at this point <laughs> yeah it sounds like you would be what color is this uh, very special 914.6 it uh, is a race car so it's currently white but it was an original car that was a paint to order in a metallic red and there was only 
less than 10, 10 of these that were ever done. Probably around five that were ever done in that color. So when it is time to restore it, after learning my lesson last time, drive it and enjoy it. Uh, when it is time to restore it, we'll take it back to that original color. Incredible story. Well, thanks for being with us here today uh, during this beautiful, sunshiny Pacific Northwest day. <laughs> Drove up from Portland this morning for this. So. Congratulations. Good to see you. Awesome. You All too, right. my friend. Thank you. So, John, welcome to uh, this beautiful Seahawks football <laughs> day here. Uh, maybe an advantage for our team, Go Hawks, but uh, appreciate you being here celebrating the 50th year of the Porsche 914. I want to talk a little bit about you first, though, and go back in time to that point in your life when you knew that you were going to be a car guy. Well, I was going back uh, first time, honestly, enjoyed cars, never really was super far into them. Uh, my buddy Jim actually lent me his bug one day to go show a coworker who was really into Volkswagens and about two minutes into driving that thing, I was hooked. Became an absolute addict. I still got an affinity for bugs today. I've actually considered turning in my Porsche for one a couple times. I know it'd be a mistake, so I won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't make that mistake, but I understand. My uh, my passion started with a Carmen Ghia, 67 Ghia, so really fun car, but that was my poor man's Porsche. Let's fast forward to the first time that you did get to finally have that Porsche. Uh, I was 21 years old. I'd gone up and was looking at one that was local, 914, complete stock body, nothing done on it. Uh, I was working to get the money together, turn around, and got a phone call that afternoon that somebody had bought it out from underneath me. Uh, about two months later, showed up to a 914 event with one of my friends that owns one, and the guy who bought the car was actually there in his old car and felt guilty about it. He goes, I'll cut you a deal. I'll sell you this one for the same. So I got a 1970 with uh, GT flares on it, wide body chassis stiffening kit, 1983 911 SC suspension in it. Ooh. Just absolute blast and paid way less than I should have considering. Yeah, well, you know, fortuitous. Uh, and then smiles for years. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So when you think about your car, it's been modified a bit, so it's kind of unique and different. But mm -hmm. is that what you like about it? Uh, honestly, I'd be fine with the stock one, too. I just really love the cars for what they are. enjoy driving them. Uh, mine stands out a little bit because of the, model, the modifications to it. Right. What color is your car? Uh, it's silver, and it's got more metal flake in it than anything you've ever seen. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Well, that makes it pretty unique as mm -hmm. well. So I like that. And what do you do for a living? I'm a materials and process engineer supervisor for Safran. So we build composite aerospace structures for Boeing, Airbus, Bombardier, Embraer. Okay. So very much a modern techie guy, uh, yep. state-of-the-art materials. When you think about the 914, though, that's a pretty simple clean easy car do you do all your own work on the car uh everything that i can do anything gets a little more technical into it or i have a concern i have a friend who's way more mechanically inclined on german cars than myself yeah. so he'll help me out with that stuff it's good to have a friend that knows how to work on stuff definitely it's like having a friend with a boat <laughs> the best kind of boat to have, right? Don't own it yourself. Don't have to waste your money on it. I think so. I think so. But when it comes to cars, it's important to have a car that you love. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been into other models of Porsches or is it always just 914 for you? Uh, big 911 fan, but it wasn't a reasonable car to try and own at the time. I was a mechanic kind of struggling paycheck to paycheck when I got mine. So that was more what I was focused on was just what would get me in the door and enjoy it. Plus, with my Volkswagen background and the 914 side of Volkswagens, that was a big draw for me. Yeah, absolutely. 911s, they've been the car of my choice for a long, long time. Uh, I haven't asked any of the guests this question, but if I could park a 911 in your garage, which model would it be? Original Carrera RS. 73, the Holy Grail, right? Of course. Yeah. Have you had a chance to ever drive one of those cars? Unfortunately not. Yeah. At least not yet. Well, when you do, and someday you probably will, it's pretty spectacular. They're really, really cool cars. Maybe start with uh, a T or, mm -hmm. or an S or an E or something like that. It'd be kind of fun. But let's talk about 914s again. If I could buy you any 914 that's out there, what would it be? I'd be torn between either an original 6 or a fully restored LE, like a K&M. Okay. Uh, kind of like the I had a guest on the show earlier that had the, uh, they talked about the Bumblebee or the Creamsicle cars. Yep, probably Is that rich. the one you're? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Do you have a preference which color you'd like? Uh, creamsicle. Creamsicle, yeah, I think so. I kind of like that one too. I think that's pretty cool. Well, I appreciate you being with, your, with us here today on this uh, wet day. We hope the Hawks win today. 
I think they will, uh, most definitely. And uh, we'll have some more fun, but mostly happy birthday to the Porsche 914. And, and congratulations to you guys like you that keep these cars going and alive. I think it's fantastic. Thanks for your time today. Thanks for having me. It's been Go great. Go Hawks. You bet. So James, welcome to another sunny day in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> a little <laughs> bit of rain today. First and foremost, uh, I love your uh, sweatshirt there, Wolfsburg logo, pretty cool. Um, love old Porsches, love old Volkswagens. We're here at the 914 turnout, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Porsche 914. So we're having fun. We've got some cars in the background here of the diehards that got out, even though it's raining, and enjoy the day a little bit. Uh, you and I got to know each other a little bit yesterday at a tech session we did at Larson Porsche, which was fun. But I want to get to know you a little bit better. So I want to go back in time and have you talk about that first time in your life when you knew you were going to be a, a car guy. So I started off very young with working on cars with my dad in the garage. Uh, our family car, one of our family cars at the time was a 1969 Volkswagen Beetle. And I believe as soon as age seven is when I started turning wrenches on that car with dad in the garage. Wow, that's pretty impressive. That's pretty young. My son, the first car he ever drove was a 73 Bug when he was eight years old on a farm. We had to put uh, blocks on the pedals and pillows behind him so he could reach it. But uh, pretty easy car to learn on. He learned how to drive a stick shift there. Almost hit a few trees, but he had some fun. So turning wrenches on an old Volkswagen kind of got you started with the VW engine uh, love or passion or knowledge, I should say. So let's fast forward to your first 914. So my first 914 came about uh, in an is interesting story a bit. Uh, so I was I was driving that that same bug when I was 19, and it I was driving around looking for work at the time. I was unemployed and stopped in one of the old Volkswagen shops I used to work at and looked over at the classified board and there was an ad up there for a 914. Didn't think too much of it. On the way home, unfortunately, I was in a, a motor vehicle accident oh, no. and the car was totaled. So I got the car back over to my house and standing there with my good friend, John, and he looks over at me and says, hey, now you can get that 914 that you always wanted. <laughs> and it clicked back in my head I had just seen this ad I called the gentleman up and a couple weeks later after the insurance settlement I was able to, to go purchase it and what kind of 914 was it that was a 75 1.8 liter car uh, it was in beautiful shape it was uh, kind of a signal yellow uh, still fuel injected very close to stock it was a great driving car and it, you still have it today unfortunately I do not no. Did that meet the same fate as FEW? Unfortunately, it did oh. uh, in a similar circumstance. Um, but I continued on with, with air cooled and got another 914 after that one. And uh, I, I've been through a couple of them now. Well, I was going to ask go for a ride with you, David. I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> yeah. So you've got a bad history of people hitting you, but I'm glad you're okay. Let's talk about the car that you have today. So the car that I have today... I, I found in 2011, I was overseas serving in the military, uh, and I decided that if I budgeted correctly, I would be able to pick up another 914 when I got back to the United States. Uh, so I found the car online in one of the 914 forums, and the gentleman made a video of a walk around, driving the car, letting it run in his driveway. Uh, I agreed that it looked absolutely uh, beautiful, and it was the car that I really wanted. Um, we came to an agreement. I put a deposit down, came back to the U.S., picked it up. Uh, so that was eight years ago, uh, and still love the car. Still in, very close to how he had it, but I've made some of my own personal modifications. The 73 2-liter, uh, it started out fuel-injected when I first bought it. Uh, the fuel injection kind of gave up the ghost and is now running carburetors and many other modifications along the way as well. A lot of people switch to carbs on those cars, but uh, as I understood yesterday at the Larson Porsche Tech Session, that the fuel injection was still pretty robust and worked pretty well, but did they just simply wear out? They wear out a bit. Uh, there are certain components of the injection systems for uh, all three of the four-cylinder engines that kind of, uh, the, the 1.7s and 2 liters are very similar in the injection system. The 1.8 is a little bit different. But each system has components that are no longer available because uh, they've been out of production for so long that if those parts fail, it can be very, very difficult to find replacements and get everything working properly again. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's 
the way it is with old cars, and that's what we kind of find them endearing, those of us who like to play with them and drive them and work on them. So let me fast forward to a little wish list for you today. If I could buy you any cool collector car, 914 though, let's stick with those. Anybody, wherever it is, I'm going to park it in your garage, what would it be? That's a really hard decision because there's so many different things you can do with them. There's the six cylinders, factory ones, conversions, uh, many other engine engine conversions that can do uh, or be done to those cars rather. Uh, I almost did a six on my car. I would still love to have one. So maybe it would be a really clean like 73 model year 1.7 that's been converted to like a 3.2, maybe a 3.6 liter air cooled six cylinder. There you go. What color? That's another really tough choice. There's a, a number of colors out there. Um, in the tech session yesterday, we mentioned that there was 55 different factory color options. And then just with the technology that we have today to paint to sample anything you want, it's just, that's really tough. Hard really to like do. blues, yeah. really like reds and greens as well. Uh, my car is silver, and I think it's a beautiful color, color on the 914 as well. It would just, it would take a very long time and multiple attempts to nail down a solid color that I'd love. We'll work on that. When you figure that out, you give me a call uh, and uh, I'll go out and find you a car. How's that sound? That sounds right. amazing. I appreciate you talking to me today. Great to get to know you better. You too, Mark. Thank you. Happy birthday to the 914. Happy birthday. So James, welcome to uh, another sunny day here in the Pacific Northwest. We're enjoying a little rain today. Seahawks football day, so go mm -hmm. Hawks. Um, you're going to be a little different guest that I'm going to talk to today because you don't have a 914. We're celebrating the birthday, 50th birthday of the 914, but you have the new cousin, let's just put it that way. Yeah. Uh, you have a Cayman, is that right? Right. Okay, so what I'd like to do first before we talk about that car is go back in history with you and mm -hmm. talk about that moment in time when you knew that you were a car guy. Well, in high school, all the guys had to have their cars. And all the guys are reading the magazines. They're reading Hot Rod. They're using, you know, uh, all the other magazines. And I'm reading Sports Car Graphic. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't until I went in the Army and I was assigned in Germany for three glorious years. We, had, we were in a sports car club called the, the Bavarian Knights in Augsburg. And in 75, we rented a tour bus, took the entire club to Stuttgart, for a tour of the factory. Wonderful. And uh, from that day forward, it was Porsche or nothing at all. And 38 years later, <laughs> I was able to finally get my Porsche. Nice. So I started out with a 944 and that was an 84, and the exterior and interior looked bad, but the mechanicals was perfect. And so we had a blast with that, and then my wife and I both lost our mothers within two weeks of one another and my wife says okay the bucket list comes out and at the top of the bucket list is a new Porsche and when I regained consciousness <laughs> uh, I said get in the car we're going to Porsche right now so we went down there test drove a Boxster and she goes but it's Washington it rains we don't need a convertible so we drive back and I'm all dejected and she goes, what, what's that over there in the corner? And I go, I have no idea. So the dealers, the salesman's coming out to me and I said, you better get the keys to whatever that black car is over there because that's where my wife's going. So, and I said, what is it? And he goes, it's a Cayman. It's the hard top version of the, the boxer. I go, oh, okay. So wife got in the car sport plus seating it totally enveloped her and she goes okay this is the one and I go can I drive the car first and all she goes yeah sure so we did instant instant love affair on the spot uh, it's the very first car we ever named and we named it the shadow because of what I used to do in the military with intelligence work and and uh, we used to our sports car club sponsored the Universal Oil Products Shadow Racing Team mm -hmm. uh, when they were overseas. And so we had all the the regalia from UOP Shadow jackets, hats, you name it. And we, we went to the, the races, the Formula One races, to see them. Yeah. And uh, so that was always a blast. 
So. Well, the shadow car is insanely fast. I mean, when it comes to vintage racing, scary cars to race, fantastic. Yeah. But first and foremost, thanks for your service to our well, country. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. But I think it's pretty spectacular that, number one, your wife had this big change of, of foresight. When you yeah. lose somebody in your family, you realize life has an end point. Right. And if you have a wish list, you better fulfill it now because mm -hmm. There is going to be an end someday, yep. and you may come sooner than you'd like. Yeah. But I love the fact that you opted for a car that you really weren't even aware of, but you got and you drove it. Now, is this her car or your car? Well, that, that's that's funny because she has never learned how to drive a stick. And this car was a five-speed, <laughs> and I go, we can wait. We can wait until an automatic comes on the lot. And she goes, no, today. It's happening today. Wow. And I go, okay. And so that's that's how it happened. And I've taken her in, let her drive uh, a Cayman automatic. She almost put us in a ditch when it happened. But once she figured out it wasn't her Kia Spectra 5 she was driving, she lightened up on yeah, yeah, definitely. The throttle goes both ways, is my saying. <laughs> exactly. Especially up here in the rain. Yeah. So let's talk about life with a Cayman. The Cayman is kind of the evolution of the 914 for yep. many people. Mm -hmm. Mid-engine car. It's the starter car for the Porsches, and the 911s are, of course, a lot more expensive. But right. every bit of a car, and I think in many respects for me, that the Cayman is much closer to a 911 than the 914s were closer to a 911 because they're spectacular cars and they handle really, really well. What's your favorite thing about driving the Cayman? The, the, the driving that Cayman is like driving a postage stamp. You're stuck to the road. There is <laughs> nothing you can do to screw that up, yeah. and as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's just the, you, you feel absolutely safe driving that because of the fact it's not like the 911 where the, the rear end's wanting to take off on you if you're not careful. And I've never had that issue with, with the Cayman at all. Yeah, they're fantastic cars. And yours is black, right? Yeah, basalt black. Basalt. Okay, so a little bit of metallic in that thing. Yes, and uh, it's it's kind of funny. We were at a Porsche parade in Salt Lake City, and I was driving to the corral that day for the 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 concours at the state capitol, and I pull in right behind a black Cayman, and. Uh, the guy was polishing his car and he looks at mine and he goes, throws his rag in the back seat of the car. Come on, let's go look at the cars. He goes, I can't, I can't touch that because it's so different, you know. Yeah, so. The great thing about the basalt, basalt black to me is it doesn't show dirt as much because it's right. got those little gold flakes Flex, a little yeah. bit in it. So you can get away with it. Black, I don't think I could own a black car. Yeah. I'm a nutcase when it comes to clean yeah. cars. So yeah. I think it's fantastic. Well, I appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you. Uh, happy birthday to the 914. The 914s are happy because now we've got the 718s, the Caymans yeah. that have uh, evolved into that car. Who knows what the next 50 years will bring us. Yeah. But congratulations to you. And I think you married the right woman, right? Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, bravo. Yeah, yeah, bravo. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. You bet. Uh -huh.